about eight inches in diameter, which is a monster. The things were very heavy. They wanted the mass in there, the mass inertia, because you can pull out of that mass inertia enormous amounts of stored energy. And when they were pulsing the system the way he was, uh, you had to use the mass inertia storage to get the additional electrical power out over the actual readings, which were 75 kVA each. So it became a very complex and interesting system. The five field coils on each one, the same total field coils, were driven with vacuum tubes. Now, was, was all the equipment on the Eldridge on the front of the ship as it was on the other front of the ship? No, everything for the Eldridge was built under, no, underneath a low deck, right. designed that way, because what they did with the Eldridge, uh, or shall I say DE-173, the one that was built for these tests was built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, well ahead of the one of record, which is in the official Navy records of 173 DE-173 named Eldridge, which was commissioned on launched in July 43 and commissioned on September 27th or 28th of 43. That's the official record for the official Eldridge. The unofficial Eldridge, the one they used in these tests which was given the same number and the same name was built during the summer of 1942 that is the hull in the summer of 1942 at the Brooklyn Navy Yard was uh, when the hull was finished was launched about September of 42 moved to the Philadelphia Navy Yard was towed over put in dry dock and they finished all of the rest of the work in dry dock which meant all of the heavy interior machinery drive systems, uh, the ship's electric generator systems, a special diesel electric generator for this system, which was 8 megawatts. Quite a big monster. They couldn't put that on deck. So uh, nothing was on deck during the... Nothing was on deck it for the like new ship. ship. It was like to appear, appear to be and look like a normal ship. And this is the way they wanted to build them, but of course this was the first one and the first of the series they hoped. So between September of 1942 and December of 1942, virtually all the heavy equipment went into the uh, DE-173. It was still in dry dock. And they had all the heavy stuff in that they need to put in the ship, including all the normal drive systems, all the normal hardware, all of the uh, ammo stacks, uh, the guns, etc., except for turret number two. That remained a dummy. There was a hole there and they put a dummy turret on them later. Uh, when they got all the heavy stuff in, they took it out of dry dock, towed it over to the section in the back where they put in the rest of the electronics. That went on from just January of 43 up through the period of June 43. Now, as Duncan and I had been selected, if you will, for these tests and for the whole project, but Neumann decided during the summer of 1942 that so what we really need, and the Navy fully agreed with him, is a specially selected test crew to be on this uh, ship for these tests. Especially clear, special aptitude, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They went throughout the whole Navy for over three months to uh, get candidates to get select when they were properly selected, which included uh, physiological testing and uh, apparently genetic testing. For what reason, I don't know. They went through a 90-day school also, which my father, and then, of course, during World War II, working as a volunteer for the Coast Guard, trained him in a Coast Guard facility. When that was done, with pictures made of the graduating class, and 33 of them, and uh, they were moved to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Now, you have this picture on the CD, correct? Yes, I have it. Okay. And, uh... Picture. Okay, we're starting with the uh, second part of our Philadelphia experiment, and I think a good place to start is to describe who you knew some of the manufacturers of the equipment were. Okay. Since uh, originally it was a Tesla project, I want us to look a little bit at the background of Tesla in order to understand why he leaned rather heavily towards Westinghouse for all of the generators and motors and such. <coughs> If you go back a little bit in his history, of course, it was George Westinghouse that first set him up in terms of the patents that 
Tesla had for the AC motors and generators, which Westinghouse built. Held, Westinghouse held the 20 patents and, of course, paid huge royalties to Tesla until Tesla tore up the agreement to save Mr. Westinghouse's neck. So he always had a strong, uh, favorable leaning towards Westinghouse and Westinghouse equipment. On the other hand, uh, GE he would have nothing to do with because GE was always backing Mr. Thomas Edison. And of course, he had a very nasty run with Thomas Edison as one of his employers when he first came to the United States. Edison welched on an agreement to pay him $50,000 bonus if he would uh, finish your project in time. That project happened to be stopping the arcing of brushes in DC motors, which uh, Edison was building on through various organizations. Edison did do quite a bit of manufacturing himself at first, but then later on became strictly the inventor and uh, having other people do all the work. But because of that incident, he wanted nothing to do with Edison or anything that Edison was connected with, so GE was out of the picture. Now, as time went on, of course, Tesla was out of it. Uh, von Neumann was not about to change horses in midstream because Westinghouse certainly built good equipment. They were building very excellent equipment, and they were already supplying some of the equipment for the project. Now, insofar as the transmitters were concerned, FTR, or Federal Telephone, as it was known then, later on became known as Federal Telephone and Radio after World War II, was quite a large supplier of radio transmitters for a number of years, both for the military and commercial. Uh, they're not known under that name anymore today. I'm not sure where they fall into in the current uh, realm of <coughs> transmitting equipment and whether they're even a business anymore as such or whether they've folded and were totally absorbed. But that was the preference and choice of Tesla at that time. And, of course, Van Neumann followed along with it because he wasn't about but the pressure that was on him to get equipment built and tested to a change to another supplier in midstream and start the whole process all over again. Because it doesn't make sense when you're on a tight schedule. So that was some of the names of the equipments that were involved there. And so far as winding coils, some of those other things are concerned, I think a lot of that stuff was done right in the shops of the Navy. The antenna system could have been built by FDR, could have been built in the Navy Yards for that matter, because they did have manufacturing facilities. And at that point, with the antenna system, uh, <coughs> me. one of the other people who was involved in designing the antenna system, after Tesla was out of it, as well as during the time he was in it, and uh, a number of other consultants came in, became part of the project in one way or another, and the total number of personnel kept going up because the aspect they considered was how fast can you get it done or more people get it done quicker. Sometimes you get in the wrong way, but at least that was the thinking at the time. There was quite a lot of people involved with the project, both at the Institute and in the Navy Yard, or the principal effort was in the Navy Yard. They had a building there, shows in the pictures I have, in which the upper floor, the top floor, was 